Mrs. Mowbray! Mrs. Mowbray! A carriage without no driver. Right out on the lawn. You stupid boy. Fat Simmons is in the vine house. Mr. Simmons! Mrs. Simmons! Mr. Simmons! Mr. Simmons! That racket immediately. Go indoors. Indoors. <laughs> Boy, run to the village, sir. Fetch the constabulary. Tell them murder most foul. Murder most foul. It is one of those felicities of fate, not unlike a sturdy brig on a stormy night happening upon a sinking merchantman, that the great Sherlock Holmes and I were in Tunlow when the double murders occurred. We were on holiday occupying What's handsome that? accommodation at Great Tunlow Hall, the country seat of Holmes' formidable godmother Cordelia. News of the murders travelled so fast through the village that we were to arrive at the scene of the deaths within minutes of the constabulary. I'm Sherlock Holmes and this is Dr. Watson. Sergeant Merriman, sir. And this be Constable Burnsbury. Uh, naturally, I had heard they were at Lady Cordelia's and uh, had hoped to have met thee at some point. Yeah, amazing it should be under these circumstances, knowing your famous ability at solving these crimes. And the other body? Uh, still in the coach, sir, uh, on the lawn. Packed a murder weapon, sir, sir. A fire iron. I think that is blood. Yes, this is blood. It's a major cranial prolapse. Several blows indicated a heavy, rounded object. Not that. There are heavy, round stones here. See if you can find one marked in blood. Yes, sir. May I take this fire down into the house? Yes, of course, sir. Come, let's view the other body. It would seem that the unfortunate passenger in the coach, a certain Colonel Harrison, the cartographer supervising the latest ordnance survey of the district, had left the Tunnel Arms Inn where he was staying to visit Bastley House to study some ancient books on local geography when fatally waylaid. Clearly the uh, firearm you're holding is the cause of this. This is not a firearm, Watson. These are port tongs of the sort in common use in a coaching inn. Two murders probably committed within minutes of each other. Two different murder weapons used, why? Have you the answer? You came here to catch fish. I believe these are very large red herring. Sherlock, how dare you? He often shuts his eyes when he is in deep thought. Oh, rubbish. He shuts his eyes when he's bored. Shall we continue? Well, this outrage at Baisley is the mirror of another brutal murder in exactly the same vicinity a hundred years ago when Baisley was in the hands of that repulsive Percy family. Are those the great Berkshire Percy's that have served Queen Bess with such distinction? Oh, cadet branch. In my opinion, the Percy's throughout English history have been swine to a man. Let us hear to the other murder. Well, it was in the year, in the summer of 1761, and there was a tenant farmer at Tunlow by the name of Hartigan, and he was working his land one day when he came upon a huge hoard of Roman jewels, gold, silver, a great fortune. Being an honest man, he went to his freeholder, Sir Peter Percy, to discuss sharing the booty. Now, this is where the story becomes speculative, but what we do know is that Hartigan was found brutally stabbed and hacked, and at the same time, a terrible change came over Sir Peter Percy, and he died almost insane, a decade later. His last words were, 
and these have been uttered down the ages, there is a treasure under the Four Oaks by the river. Well, nobody ever found the Four Oaks or the treasure by any local river. A treasure under Four Oaks by a river. In the late Colonel Harrison, in his cartographic explorations of this area, did indeed come across Four Oaks by a river and told someone. Sherlock, we're talking of the year 1761. Miss the great British oak is renowned for its longevity. Much like you, dear godmother. Inquiries by Sergeant Merriman produced the names of Colonel Harrison's closest colleagues on the survey. One was a Mr. Astridge of Cheltenham. Holmes invited this man to grace Lady Cordelia's drawing room for a dinner time preprandial, offering port from a bottle opened with the very port tongs that had been one of the murder weapons. Holmes studied the man's reactions throughout. For a week, Holmes paced the countryside, not revealing any of his intentions to me, for he said he had none that were explicable. He would offer only cryptic mutterings. Four oaks, four oaks, four oaks. And a river. Twice, we met on our countryside peregrinations, Mr. Astridge, theodolite in hand, shifty expression to face. Good morning, gentlemen. Mr. Astridge. There is a man who knows well my reputation and has something to hide. It was late on Saturday night that we were summoned to a room in the Tunlow Inn where Astridge had stayed and was reported to have left suddenly. So, according to the landlord, upped and left at midnight. It took everything with him, clothes, books, drawing equipment, the lot. An Italian amethyst. The stone art coming from the Roman Empire's first tentative trade with India. Set in gold with what looks like a high copper content. Perhaps the room settlement in Welver in Spain. I think we're looking at a piece of jewelry from Barone the Horde that has already cost two lives. And that was as far as it ever went. Within days, urgent news of another matter took Sherlock Holmes to Switzerland. I had one telephone call from him from Paris during which he said he had solved the mystery of the Roman horde. You shall know all on my return. But alas, for all of us, he met his own nemesis on the side of a mountain in Switzerland. I imagine we will never now solve the mystery of the Roman horde, the Four Oaks, the river, and the Tumlow murders. Or will we? Mm -hmm.